Thank you, Brother Jim. I want to welcome everybody out here today. Um, so it's a good crowd, but this, this crowd's always a good crowd, no matter how many show up. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Church of Christ here at Lacey Creek, and I hope that whatever you've come here for today will, uh, will be realized by you, that, that you might be blessed by the hearing of the Word. Uh, hope and pray you've already been blessed by the, by the singing to the Lord, and by participating in communion with Him, and being able to, to give of, of the things that He's blessed us with, to be able to help others. Uh, if you turn with me to Colossians chapter 3, and also in our song books, if you turn to Colossians, or that's in the Bible, uh, number 590 will be our song of invitation today. If there's anybody here that's, that's not a Christian, if you'd like to give your life to the Lord at that time, if, if you've heard the word and you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and, and uh, you've repented and you'd like to come forward and confess him before man to be baptized for the remission of sins, we'd, we'd ask you to do so at that time. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul writes this letter to the Christians there in Colossae. And, and chapter 3 starts off, it says, If ye then be risen with Christ. Now, you know, ten days before Pentecost, Jesus was raised into heaven. He was raised up on a cloud. Well, nobody's done that with him. You know, it can't be talking about that, being risen with Christ. That's not what that's referring to. Because the people in Colossae had not been risen with him in that manner. We haven't been risen with him in that manner. So how have we been risen with Jesus Christ? If ye then be risen with Christ is what it says. He doesn't say, you know, if you might be we're risen with him someday. But this is something that happened. And that's what this whole chapter is about. The people that have been risen with Christ. This is things for them. And all we have to do is simply go back earlier in the previous chapter. Uh, right there in the same letter to the church of Colossae, verse 12. Paul writes, buried with him in baptism. Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. If we have been risen with Christ, it says we are to seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Those things which are above, it takes away all doubt. It says where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, it's talking about heaven. That's what we're to seek. We're told to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Paul's writing to the Christians there in Colossae, and he says, since you've done this, since you have been risen with Christ, I want you to seek first the kingdom of God. I want you to seek it. How do we seek the kingdom of God? You know, we have lives here on earth. We have jobs. We have family. We have a lot of things we do. Jesus said we need to love him more than we love our family. You know, we're told we need to have jobs, too, because he that doesn't care for his own, and especially for those of his own house, is worse than an infidel. They've denied the faith. So we need to have jobs. So there's things we need to do in this life. But pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. We live in this world, but we're not to be of the world. The difference here is we need to look toward the eternal rather than the temporary. The things of this life are all temporary. They're not going to last forever. Life itself, we're told in the book of James, is like a vapor. It doesn't last very long. We're going to spend eternity someplace other than this. Don't you want it to be in heaven? So how important is it that we seek to live forever with Christ in heaven during this life? It's the only time we've got to seek it. And we need to seek it. In Revelation 22, 14... It says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, 
that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. How do we see? By doing what the Lord tells us to, by being obedient to him. We're told, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, we, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him. It doesn't say all those that believe in him or all they that love him, but those that obey him. That's how we show that we believe in him. That's how we show that we love him. It's through our obedience to him. And we're told also in, the, in Revelation that we're going to be judged by our works. I know that's a terrible thing to, to preach in a lot of places, but that's exactly what it says in Revelation. Um, chapter 20. Beginning with verse 12, it says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. Has anybody ever really stopped and looked at that? The books were opened, and then another book, the book of life, was opened also. What were the books? Let's continue reading there. The, the books were opened, and then another book, which is the book of life, the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. The things that were written in the books. What would those books be? Would it not be what we've been given, the perfect law of liberty? The New Testament? When we're told this is how we're supposed to live our lives, in, in, in this life, you know, you can go to a book of law and say, you know, you ran a stop sign right here in the book of law that says you weren't supposed to do that, so you're guilty. You know, when we stand before the Lord, and he says you shouldn't have done this right here in this book, it says you weren't supposed to do that. Or right here in this book, that's what it said you were supposed to do. The books will be opened. And the book of life will be opened. And we will be judged according to our works. You know, some people, they, they say, oh, you know, I'm in love with this person or I'm in love with that person. But love is not just what you say. Love is how you live your life for that person. The things you do for them. It's wanting them to do more or to do more for them, to help them. It's living your life for them as well. And that's what we need to do for Jesus Christ because we need to love him more. Than we do our family. So we need to live our lives for him. That's how we seek. After the things above. Verse 2 says. Set your affection on things above. Not on things on this earth. And on the three. For ye are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. Ye are dead. You know it's talking about. We, we stay away from the things of this world. Because we are dead. It's what it's saying there in Romans chapter 6, beginning with verse 3. We're told what it's talking about here, that, that we are dead. Know ye not that so many of us as have, been, as have been baptized into Jesus Christ have been baptized into his death. When we're baptized, we're put to death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism. Buried. Some people say, you know, there's there's other ways to be baptized. But, you know, when, when I'm dead and somebody takes me out here to this cemetery out here, I hope they don't just sprinkle a handful of dirt on me or hit me with a shovel full of dirt. Buried means buried. You're under the grave. You're covered completely. We're buried with him in baptism. Into death, it says. That like Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. The old man is buried. The old man is dead. The man that serves sin is gone. And we rise in a newness. 
to start living for Jesus Christ. We're no longer in that, we're no longer a sinful person. We start living for Jesus Christ. Doesn't mean we never commit sin. If you go on down to uh, Romans 6 verse 14, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law but under grace. Having dominion over me, you means you're not living that way anymore. It doesn't mean you may not occasionally sin, because we all sin and come short of the glory of God. And even John writes in uh, 1 John 1, if we, if we, is what John said, we, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the Apostle John. He's saying we. And he will cleanse us from our righteousness. And then actually in uh, 1 John 2, 1, verse 2, it's speaking to Jesus here when it says, and he is the propitiation for our sins. Again, he's saying our but then he says, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So there he takes in the alien sinner. So it's both. And a lot of people want to say when John says our, he's talking about the alien sinner. But John's talking about Christians and about himself when he writes that. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members, mortify just means put to death, your members which are upon the earth. And here's the things we are to put to death. Fornication. Fornication is, is sexual sin. Doesn't matter, you know, if you're married and you have, have sex with someone else or something else, it's Adultery would be taken into fornication. People that aren't married and never have been married, it's fornication. We need to mortify that. We need to get it out of our lives. Now again, who's he talking to here? He's talking about those that have been risen with Christ. Those that have been baptized for the remission of sins, that have put off the old body, and they're talking about the new man that rises up to walk in the fullness of life with Jesus Christ. We need to put off fornication. We put off uncleanness. Inordinate affection, which is inordinate is, is vile. Vile affections or, or passions. Evil concupiscence or evil desires. We need to get rid of all these. And covetousness. You know, covetousness is desiring something or more of what we have. Or something we don't have. You know, and often uh, covetousness, we say, you know, covetousness is terrible. Don't ever have anything to do with covetousness. But Paul does tell us in uh, 1 Corinthians 12 that we are to desire the, or to covet the good things. There are things that we should desire in our lives. The eternal things. You know, the things that would help us to live for the Lord. Those things we should desire. But this is talking about the covetousness, which is, is wanting things that, that aren't ours, that don't belong to us. And it says idolatry. And idolatry is worshiping things that, that are not God. Anything at all that we might worship. And notice what it says here. It doesn't just list covetousness and then idolatry. It says covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness is idolatry. We usually think of idolatry, we look back at the at the pagans that would, would make these wooden carvings, carvings or some kind of statues and they would worship them. But you know some things that we covet. We may covet to have more money. That's idolatry. When we care more about money than we do about the Lord, then money's become our God. And it is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. The children of disobedience. They're the ones that, that continue to practice fornication and uncleanness and inordinate affections and all the things that were right there in that previous verse. Those that have never been baptized for remission of sins. Those that are not living for Christ. Those that have never been risen with Christ. 
They are the children of disobedience. In the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. At one time they walked, at one time we walked that before we were risen with Christ, before we put off the old man. At that time, we walked in. But that doesn't mean we need to continue to walk in. I want to read a few verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Beginning with verse 9, uh, Paul writes to the church of Corinth here, he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. The next verse says, And such were some of you. But ye are washed. But ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Such were some of you. Such were some of us. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We used to live in sin until we gave our life to Jesus Christ. And we were buried with him in baptism and then we were risen with Christ. In verse 8 it says, But now ye also put off all these. Okay, these are things you know about that he said a couple verses ago, all the, the fornication and everything. These are things they were aware of. But he says now, in addition to that, I want you to put these things off also. Anger, wrath, malice. You know, those words are, are pretty much synonymous. And if you use just one of those words, it would any one of them would pretty much have the same meaning. But used in, in order like that, it, it, anger is, is when we get mad, basically. But then it turns to wrath, or it becomes more of a violent rage. And we start showing it. And then it gets to malice, which actually comes to the point where we may desire to hurt somebody else. Or to cause them some type of injury. You know, it could be a physical injury. It could also be a spiritual or mental injury. Sometimes we say things that hurt. And they hurt bad sometimes. And if you notice as we go on through here, the next thing that's mentioned is blasphemy, which is saying things against the Lord, basically, um, or evil speaking against God saying things that are contrary to it, that Jesus was accused of blasphemy because he said he was God. You know, saying anything against the Lord, anything that others believe to be evil would be blasphemy against the Lord. We often think of blasphemy, people think about taking the name of the Lord in vain. You know, and I, I never, people say taking the name of the Lord in vain is, is when you use the Lord's name with some swear words. But vain does not mean cussing or swearing. Vain means without thinking about it. You know, I see people all the time on TV, they may win a prize, and go, oh God, oh God, oh God. They're taking the name of the Lord in vain. If you're saying His name without thinking about it, not in worship for Him or of Him, it's in vain, it's without thinking about it. Blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth. All of these things are things we also need to continue to work on. Lie not one to another. Man, you go to Revelation there and look at who's going to be spending <laughs> time in the eternal fire. Let me get to Revelation 20. 21 rather, verse 8. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. 
Look at the list there. Lying is one of them. We can't lie. Not and serve God and not and seek the things which are above <coughs> as we're told we need to do. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. The old man was put to death when we were buried in baptism. And the deeds that went with that old man were put to death also. They're gone. They're no longer a part of us. Now when you, when you take off a suit of clothes, normally you put another suit back on. So when that old man is put off, we need to put another one back on. Verse 10 says, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. That new man should be in the image of Jesus Christ. We should walk and talk like Jesus Christ. Do we? Well, I wish we did. But again, we all still, we do still live on this earth. There's a lot of sin in this earth. But we need to continue to seek the things which are above. Seek the eternal things. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, this doesn't mean, you know, heaven doesn't contain any of these people. This, there's not a difference between these people is what it's saying. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, uh, Greeks would be Gentiles or Jewish. There's no difference between the two. Circumcision or uncircumcision, the same thing, Greek and Jewish. Barbarians, which w would be a foreigner. Scythians, which was somebody, actually was just somebody that was considered to be below average. Uh, either in their status or in their intelligence or whatever, somebody that was below average. Bond or free, somebody that's a slave or somebody that may have slaves or somebody that is, is free to make their own decisions. But Christ is all in and in all. It doesn't matter what our old man was. When it's put to death in the watery grave of baptism, and it rises again to walk in a newness of life. It's in the image of Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter what it was like before. It becomes the image of Jesus Christ. And we need to continue to live that. And we need to continue to strive to be in the image of Jesus Christ. Putting on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies. You know, God was merciful to us. Why can't we be merciful to other people? Kindness. Again, that's, that's helping other people out, doing what we can for somebody else. Humbleness in mind. Meekness. Long-suffering. Forbearing one another. Forbearing is, is being patient with one another. We need to continue to be patient with each other. You know, sometimes we may say, you know, well, I know what the Bible says about this topic, but this poor soul over here, he doesn't have a clue. I'm not holding point the ball. <laughs> but we may, we may think that sometimes. You know, and if we know that what we believe is according to the Bible, then we need to stick with it, but we need to help this individual. We need to do what we can for them out of love, out of kindness, because we love them, but we need to be patient or long-suffering and forbear them. Now remember, they may be thinking the same thing about us. That poor soul. Is that what he really believes? That's why it is so important that we continue to go back to God's Word. People will disagree with you on, on what the Bible says, and they may be totally, you don't know where they're coming from. But we need to stick with the Bible. And I have, I have heard people, as mentioned in Sunday school, I've heard people say, I know that's what the Bible says, but this is the way I believe. We can't do that. We've got to believe what the Bible says, whether we like it or not. God said it. That settles it. It doesn't matter whether we believe it or not. It matters, but not, not according, you know, it matters where we spend eternity if we don't believe it. But we need to follow what God says and what the Bible says. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. 
contentions. That's one of the things. It's petty little concerns over over little little things that don't really mean anything. It's it's uh, referred to here as, as the little foxes sometimes. It's the little things that creep in and they, they get bigger and bigger. You know, a little fox gets through a fence and, and, and gets out into the world or something on the other side of the fence. As it grows, it can't get back in anymore. The hole's not big enough. The fox is stuck out there. It's the same way with our sin. If we start with little sins, they start to grow. And they get so big that they overwhelm us sometimes. And as Christ forgave us, we need to forgive others. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Charity, that, that means love. We need to put on charity. We're told in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Now, continue three. Faith, hope, and charity, or love. These three. And the greatest of these is love. Love is greater than hope. Because when hope, and it's, and it's greater than faith, because when hope and faith, when we enter into heaven, our hope is realized. Our faith is realized. So hope is no longer hope, and faith is no longer hope, but love will continue. So love is stronger than faith or hope. And it's much greater than faith or hope. And again, as I mentioned earlier, love is not just saying the words, I love you. Love is living your life for somebody else. Doing whatever you can to help them, to make them happy, to please them. That's what love's all about. And that's exactly when we love Jesus more than we love anybody else. It's doing the things that make him happy. It's, it's doing for him and living for him and loving him. That's what it's all about. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be thankful. We need to continue to be thankful. In Colossians 1, verse 18, we're told what that one body is. It says, And he, that being Jesus Christ, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. The church is that one body. It's the body of Christ, of which he is the head in which we are subject to do His will. And it ends by saying, and be ye thankful. I've been thinking today before the message how blessed we are here at Lacey Creek. You know the Carolyn yesterday? We talked about the little kids. That's the future of the church. That's where it's at. We need to keep them in the church. We need to keep them coming so that they get to know the Lord and they start living their lives for the Lord. We are so blessed. There's so many congregations anymore that don't even have any little kids. You know, and, and not only that, we've, we've got men and women that will step up and work here in, the, in this congregation. I've been coming here since 1985. And in August every year, we, we select new people for, for Sunday school teachers and, and for all the other different areas in the, in, the, in the congregation here that need to be taken care of. We don't have to pull teeth to get somebody to do it. we got people saying, oh, I, I'll do that, or, or yeah, I'd like to continue doing it unless, unless somebody else wants it. I said pretty regularly. I'd like to continue doing it, but if somebody else wants it, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to let them do something too. There's so many things that go on here, and they just continue to go on here at Lacey Creek. And we need to be thankful. We certainly do. If you're healthy today, you need to be thankful. If you're sick today, you need to be thankful. And we're told to pray without ceasing. Be thankful in all things. That's what we're told to do. And sometimes it's hard to, but we don't see the big picture. The Lord does. And the Lord knows what's going on. The Lord's going to take care of us. All things work together for good to them that love the Lord. 
to them who are the called according to his purpose. This time, if you're not a Christian, as I said before, if you'd like to give your life to the Lord, if you've heard the word, if you believe it, and you'd like to repent, you need to go ahead and repent and ask the Lord for forgiveness and ask that you might start living your life for Him. And then if you'd like to come forward, we will give you the opportunity to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And do that before men as He tells us we need to. And then be baptized for the remission of sins. Let us stand as we sing number 590 of the song of invitation.